Um, well, thank you, Jonathan, for this invitation, and thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for, for, for coming this evening. I thought I would perhaps start perhaps by saying a little bit about what oral medicine is and, and what we actually do. Um, as Jonathan said, I work in the dental hospital. We are a, a dental specialty, but um, most of us have actually done medicine as well. We've sort of followed the initial part, if you like, of the, the MaxFax training, but have veered off into medicine rather than surgery. Um, as well as pain, which is obviously the subject of tonight's talk, we do see a lot of mucosal disease, um, so therefore we interact quite closely with dermatology because a lot of these patients have skin disease as well. Rheumatology, haematology, gastroenterology, neurology and so on, um, because we deal largely with the oral manifestations of systemic disease. Um, I will say a little bit about um, ordinary common or garden toothache but that's really just to distinguish it from from sort of the other types of pain that we that we see on, on a more complex basis um, so essentially we can divide the pain that we see up into odontogenic which is basically toothache now we don't um, get toothache referred to us we get pain referred to us which dentists or GPS or other specialists like yourself have more or less thought it's not a dental problem it's not toothache can you see what it is? But sometimes toothache is quite hard to identify as coming from teeth. So I suppose our dental background helps us distinguish what is likely still to be a dental cause, which we will then put back to primary care, um, or what is likely to be a non-dental cause, a non-odontogenic facial pain, which is uh, what our areas of interest, uh, where our, er our interests lie. Um, so I'll talk largely about the non-odontogenic facial pains, but just a little bit about boring old toothache. Now, I suppose you could probably imagine that the patient presenting with this kind of mouth would be in some kind of dental pain. This is not usually what we would see, but if we did see it, we would say you have to eliminate toothache as a cause of their symptoms before we see what we're left with um, and, and unfortunately toothache and decay and the consequences of that are, are still pretty common um, in young children in this part of the world as well. Um, what can happen to teeth? Well you can get decay, that can spread to involve the pulp of the tooth and I'll show you that on a, on a radiograph shortly. Pulpitis is a throbbing pain poorly localised, um, stimulated by hot and cold, um, and if any of you have suffered from it, uh, as you know, probably we all have at some point, it is extremely uh, commanding, but it's poorly localised, and particularly if the patient has many restorations, many fillings already, it can be very difficult to identify where it's coming from. If that inflammation and often infection spreads out of the pulp, beyond the root canal, into the, the bone surrounding the teeth, you will get periapical inflammation, which makes the tooth tender to bite on. Um, so again, that helps us narrow it down to, to where it's happening. That may progress to an abscess or a gum boil, if you like. And then the consequences of that um, are often root canal treatment or extraction of the tooth. Um, as we get older, we do get longer in the tooth, literally with gum recession, and that can create sensitivity, the kind of things that you see advertised on TV for Sensodyne toothpaste, the sort of the lightning bolts coming out of your mouth when you eat ice cream or something like that. And some people who have a tendency to clench their teeth or grind their teeth in their sleep uh, exert such forces on the teeth that the teeth can crack. They don't necessarily break, but you will develop cracks within the substance of the tooth which you can't necessarily see with the naked eye, but if it cracks extend into the pulp or the root, that causes severe pain, which again can be very difficult to manage, and often those teeth have to be extracted. Um, just a little bit of orientation. This, um, these are fairly typical <coughs> x-rays that um, may be taken in a dental setting. The top two, again, this is um, sort of the standard way of presenting it. This is the right side, and this is the right side of an orthopantomogram, and this is the left side. This is the same patient. Now, this is a child, probably about eight years old. They're in what's called the mixed dentition stage. They have their second incisors, their um, permanent incisors, uh, incisor teeth through. The first permanent molars are through, but they have developing premolars, canine teeth, still waiting to come through. On these bite wings, which are taken in adults as well, um, to look for decay in the, the joins between the teeth. Unfortunately, this child has several areas of decay, these dark shadows appearing within the substance of the tooth, here, 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 and also over here. So some of these teeth may not survive and have to be extracted, um, which 
it's too soon for the permanent teeth which aren't ready so they'll have gaps which can cause movement of teeth and crowding and lead to sort of orthodontic problems and so on. But again, I mentioned the pulp of the tooth which can be, is a source of pulpitis. That's the chamber within a tooth um, with this sort of H shape uh, up here where the, there, is, there, is, there are neurovascular bum, bundles and these um, go down into the root canals which if any of you have had root canal treatment that's the bit that gets taken out and this is the source of the pain and these are where the, the root canal treatments are carried out. So it's kind of a depressing picture to see this much decay in a young child. As I mentioned, if the inflammation is in the pulp, it's poorly localised. The patient will say, I've got pain on the left side of my face, but I don't know if it's my upper or my lower jaw, and I don't know which tooth it is. If, however, the inflammation spreads down the root canal into the bone, or the apices of the teeth, there are proprioceptors and pain receptors there, so the pain will be localised when it's into the bone, and the tooth will be tender to bite on or tender to percussion if it's tapped with an instrument. So that, again, helps, helps us localise things. Um, and just again another slightly depressing slide again these are periapical x-rays a little bit deeper down uh, the roots than the earlier x-rays I showed but th these teeth this is a huge cavity this is uh, all decay in here and in this tooth into the pulp and this is a horizontally impacted wisdom tooth which is partially erupted but the bit that has come through into the mouth has rotted away as well so all of these teeth are essentially uh, for the bucket um, it's very difficult to restore a tooth and on x-ray the changes are not as advanced as they will be clinically if you look into the tooth so the pulp is involved there's a periapical infection here these teeth will be very painful to bite on or to tap and this will be and very difficult to get this tooth out because it will just start to crumble and it's partially covered in bone behind there. So something to be avoided if possible. So that was all I proposed to say about toothache. This is, as I say, this is what we um, get referred and sometimes we separate out into what is still dental and send it back to primary care. I propose to talk about these things mainly because this is something that we are very familiar with in oral medicine and oral surgery. It's, not, it's maybe something that you're not so familiar with in your, your daily practice. It's not an exclusive list. I'm not, I haven't included sinusitis. I haven't included giant cell arteritis, which you will probably be familiar with, which can present with uh, jaw claudication and, and temporal pain. And I haven't included the obvious sources of pain like mucosal ulceration, mucosal lesions, and so on. So this is just concentrating more that, on things that we see regularly, um, but have you know perhaps signs and symptoms that, that are, are, are not so familiar. Um, temporomandibular dysfunction, um, you will also see it written as temporomandibular joint dysfunction, temporomandibular pain dysfunction syndrome. It's, it's probably more accurate to say temporomandibular dysfunction because not all of the pain results uh, from the joint itself. The joint may be relatively normal but it's myofascial pain from structures around the joint. We see idiopathic pains, atypical facial pain, burning mouth or burning mouth syndrome. We do see quite a lot of <coughs> trigeminal neuralgia and we do occasionally see cases of post-herpetic neuralgia following shingles in the, in the orofacial region. And I'll talk um, about each of these. So temporomandibular dysfunction is defined as pain arising in the muscles of mastication or within the temporomandibular joints or both. And a lot of patients come in and say, oh, my jaw dislocates on a regular basis. Well, actually, true dislocation is pretty rare. And just like many other joints, it's not possible for the patient to put their joint back into position if they have truly dislocated it. Um, patients will complain that their jaw sticks from time to time, but that's not actually dislocation. I'll tell you more about sticking joints. So dislocation of the temporomandibular joints is rare. So the pain can arise from myofascial pain, the muscles of mastication around the joint. Um, there may be internal derangement of the meniscus or the disc that sits within the TMJs, and I'll show you a, a, a diagram of that shortly. Or you may get degenerative disease around the joint, osteoarthritis or involvement with rheumatoid arthritis or psoriatic arthritis, for example. Or you can get a combination of these things in any one patient. 
Um, the anatomy of the joint, I'm sure you're familiar with this, but just to orientate you, this is posterior, this is the external auditory canal, the mastoid bone, styloid process. So the mouth is over here somewhere. Um, there are two spaces in the joint. There's an upper and lower joint space. So this is the mandibular condyle, the head of the condyle here, um, with the meniscus or the disc here, which is attached to muscle fibres at the back and at the front. And then there's the, um, the glenoid fossa, the, the mandibular fossa, where the, the articulation uh, takes place. And then there's the articular eminence anteriorly. So in order to dislocate the TMJ, the condyle has to come forward and out and get stuck anterior to the articular uh, eminence. So that doesn't really happen that often. But what can happen, um, the disc which is meant to move forward and back with the condyle as the condyle rotates and glides when you open your mouth. Due to muscle tension, perhaps by opening too wide, a sudden traumatic movement of the jaw, or by chronic um, tension from clenching or grinding the teeth, the disc can be pu pulled anteriorly at rest. So when the patient goes to try and move uh, or open the jaw, you get clicking, which is the condyle catching up with the disc in its anterior position, and then re leaving the disc if the disc doesn't uh, displace backwards again. And you can get locking or stiffness or difficulty because the disc is basically in the wrong place at the wrong time. So that's a very common presentation, disc displacement uh, with reduction. So the disc isn't stuck permanently, but it will move, but it moves at the wrong time uh, in relation to the, the head of the condyle. But lateral pterygoid is the muscle that helps pull the condyle forward and often that muscle is the source of quite a lot of pain in these patients. Um, the symptoms that patients will describe, um, pain around the joint, limitation of opening or limitation of lateral excursions of the joint when they're trying to chew, joint sounds like clicking, which is a very distinct single sound, or crepitus, which is a gravelly or squeaking sound locking of the, the jaw or difficulty opening and closing and at times they may have headache in association with, with muscle tension. The signs that you may be able to elicit are tenderness on palpation of the muscles of mastication. You may hear or be able to palpate if you put your fingers over the jaw, over the head of the condyle, clicking, crepitus. You may see limitation of opening. Now the, the normal distance of or the normal range of opening, if you measure between the lower edge of the upper incisor teeth and the upper edge of the lower incisor teeth, 35 to 40 millimetres in an adult is the normal opening range. So anything less than that, around 30 millimetres or less, is limitation of opening. They may deviate to one side or the other on opening. If you look at the teeth and they're a tooth grinder, you may see quite a lot of tooth wear. And the muscles of mastication themselves may be hypertrophic. Again, if you put your hands up to the patient's masseter muscles and ask them to clench, you'll feel them bulge a bit like biceps that have been worked well. And in fact, in some patients, the muscle hypertrophy is enough to stimulate um, expansion of the angle of the mandible. So you, the patients get a squaring off appearance. Um, David Coulthard, the racing driver, is a good example of, of ma masseter muscle hypertrophy with probably some um, increase in size of the bone at the angles of the mandible to support the enlarged muscle. If you suspect TMD and you want to investigate further, what do you do? Well, imaging of the joint can be very helpful, but plain radiographs are not that helpful. You don't see the disc on a radiograph and you will only see very gross changes if there is degenerative change. So radiographs are not really that helpful and indeed in my own hospital and other departments we will not be granted um, a radiograph of the temporomandibular joints. If you think there's bony change then a CT scan is ideal. If you're looking for the position of the disc and movement or lack of it then an MRI scan is helpful and that will also include the adjacent skull base. If there is trismus and you're concerned about any adjacent pathology and ultrasound can be helpful in terms of looking at the disc movements as well. So radiographs are not really ideal for TMD. Apart from the patients that present with symptoms, a lot of cases of meniscal displacement are actually asymptomatic. And the majority of these, once they're identified, can be managed in primary care, um, usually involving the dental practitioner. And I'll mention how this, how, what treatments can be involved. 
And like many kinds of pain in various parts of the body, patients cope differently with their symptoms. Um, one meta-analysis suggested that at least if you question a wide range of adults, 50% will report that they have had noise from the joints or stiffness from the TM joints at some point in their life, and 10% will report that they've had pain. We do see a number of children and adolescents with clicking of the joints, but that doesn't necessarily lead to, on to any long-lasting problem or any pathology in the joints. And less than 10% of adults will report ever having sought care for temporomandibular joint pain. In terms of the arthritides, there is a poor correlation between what you may see, as I've mentioned, on radiographs and the actual clinical signs and the patient's symptoms. Um, we have a number of patients who have crepitus with quite marked um, signs, but um, they're not complaining particularly of any symptoms and there is, they may have quite marked changes on, on, radio, on, on imaging, on CT. So there's not really a good correlation between signs and radiographic features. And for some reason, the minority of patients with the rheumatoid arthritis have severe TMJ damage. Whether that's due to it not being a weight-bearing joint um, is, is not entirely clear. But 50% of patients with RA may have symptoms from the temporomandibular joints. And we would manage that basically in the same way we, that we would manage TMD in other patients. But also these patients may well be on disease-modifying disease medication already, which will help. The management of this in general tends to be very conservative. Um, we do advise a soft diet. Um, we do tend to ask patients not to try and bite into apples open wide. A lot of patients say, I keep testing it to see how it is. I keep stretching it to see if it's any better. We discourage that. Um, it's not an easy joint to rest because of chewing, speaking, yawning and so on. We do um, ask about additional habits. Um, are you, do you bite your fingernails? Do you chew gum? And if so, don't. Because in order to do that, you create a lot of extra muscle strain and movement around the jaw joint, which we're trying to discourage. Um, trying, pain relief is important, again, to try and get some muscle relaxation around the joint. So non-steroidal anti-inflammatories or paracetamol. Um, heat, a warm towel, something like that on the muscles, again, can be helpful. Um, we will refer patients to their dental practitioners for a bite splint if there's signs that they are uh, clenching or grinding their teeth. Um, and that is to try and discourage that clenching or grinding, which is often happening in their sleep. Um, and they can wear these splints overnight. Um, some patients who are bruxis, those who are habitual grinders of their teeth, and some of these patients will admit to doing it during the day as well, there is a room for hypnosis in these patients. Some patients do very well, and we have a practitioner in our hospital who will do muscle relaxation and hypnosis therapy with them, which can be quite beneficial. <coughs> in acute, severe cases of muscle pain around the joints, we do um, suggest maybe three to five days of di low-dose diazepam, just to try and get a little bit of relaxation, particularly if there's trismus involved. Um, and there is no hard and fast evidence that amitriptyline, for example, is statistically beneficial in these patients who have longer term problems with pain. But a number of patients do find that beneficial. And there is some evidence also for gabapentin in these patients. If there are signs and symptoms suggesting degenerative change, um, then arthro there is a place for arthro arthrocentesis, be it saline lavage, uh, intra, uh, intra capsular um, or intra articular steroid injection or hyaluronic acid. There's no sp specific difference between the outcomes for each of these treatments, but certainly lavage has a place to play. Um, and if the disc is uh, displaced and not moving, then arthroscopy, you can have the disc re uh, repositioned arthroscopically. Surgery is an absolutely last resort, um, and you can get uh, a temporomandibular joint prosthesis. Um, there's currently a document out from NICE out to consultation about uh, the role of um, joint replacement uh, for the temporomandibular joints. Um, the patients have to be very carefully selected, and the longer term outcomes are not entirely clear. So again, surgery on temporomandibular joints is, is a last resort. Moving on to the atypical uh, or the idiopathic orofacial pains, um, 
three main categories, one of which is a sort of subset of the other. Atypical facial pain is now known as persistent idiopathic facial pain and is probably a neuropathic pain. Burning mouse syndrome, there is such a thing as burning mouse syndrome. Patients complain of burning mouth, but there is a syndrome called of burning mouth. Um, which again is probably neuropathic in origin. And then there is atypical odontalgia, which is a localised version um, around one or two teeth or around sites where teeth have been extracted. Patients have persistent pain and it's probably a localised version of persistent, uh, more widespread idiopathic facial pain. And in common with a number of chronic pain uh, conditions around the body, these syndromes may occur simultaneously or uh, um, consecutively in a lot of patients and some of these patients have back pain, neck pain, um, whole body pain, medically unexplained symptoms and so on. So, so these patients will fit into other pain categories as well quite often. What is the role for hormones? There is a lot of evidence to suggest um, a role for female hormones. Um, there is a female preponderance in uh, these patients now, whether that is simply a reporting difference, um, men do perhaps have these symptoms, but they don't perhaps present. But certainly on a clinical basis, the majority of the patients that we see are female. And there is, seems to be a split from menopause onwards. Um, they tend to statistically fall into the idiopathic facial pains, atypical odontalgia and burning mouth syndrome. But from puberty to menopause, it's temporomandibular joint or myofascial pain and we rarely see these things post-menopause in women. And there are some theories about oestrogen deficiency and its effect on pain uh, perception that may account for these differences. A PIFP is the diagnosis of exclusion, and again, that's often why by the time patients come to us, a whole lot of other things have been investigated and ruled out. It's a daily pain um, it's poorly localised, it's usually unilateral and it tends to be more maxillary um, or periorbital. There are no objective neurological deficits and there is no detectable abnormality. It's not a dental problem, it's not a temporomandibular joint problem, it's not an intraoral mucosal problem, it's not sinusitis, so it's a diagnosis of exclusion. But as I mentioned, it can occur in combination with irritable bowel syndrome and pain elsewhere in the body. And often by the time the patients come to us, they have had these symptoms, whether they have reported them or not, for many years, um, which makes it more difficult to, uh, to do anything about. These patients do display altered behaviour patterns and there's a strong association with anxiety and depression in these patients measured by hospital anxiety and depression score, BET depression inventory and so on. They have had and continue to have a high utilisation of health services and they may have already undergone extensive investigations and treatment, particularly dental treatment, um, before uh, reaching our clinic. Quite a number of these patients, however, do report that they associate a dental procedure with the onset of their pain symptoms and therefore that has led to the theory that this is a neuropathic pain. In decades past, these patients were often thought of as um, somatizing or that this was a, an imaginary pain and so on. So a lot of patients had come in very, very concerned that we believe that they are actually in pain and certainly we do. And I say there is a lot of evidence to support the fact that it is a neuropathic pain in origin. And very often at the very first visit, the patients are relieved and that seems to have a beneficial effect on their, their symptoms and their management that, that we know that they are not imagining this. This will be a familiar list to you in terms of any kind of chronic pain um, management. Um, we use antidepressants and there is a list of antidepressants that have been tried but I would say that currently we tend to use um, chronic pain guidelines so we will use amitriptyline, nortriptyline at first um, just as we would for chronic pain elsewhere. We sooner rather than later now tend to engage the pain clinic, as Jonathan knows, possibly to his cost. We, we do refer a lot of patients onwards um, to try and get a multidisciplinary approach. And I say often when these patients have had this pain for many years, we try to avoid high expectations because we cannot necessarily get these patients um, completely better. It is important that we discuss with their dentist and with the patient that they avoid any unnecessary dental treatment because that sim simply serves to stimulate the nerves 
and entrench the pain even more. And a lot of these patients, by the time they get here, they have had numerous fillings, <coughs> numerous root treatments, and then numerous extractions um, to try and get to the, 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 I was going to say the root, forgive me, the, the bottom of this problem. Um, and, you know, that in a sense makes our, our work easier. The diagnosis is already made. They've had lots of dental treatment. The pain persists. The pain will move. They have a back tooth out. It moves further forward. They have that tooth out. It moves. They've often lost a great many teeth and the pain has just simply shifted forward. So, yes, they may need some dental treatment, but not any further explore, exploratory treatment in relation to this pain. As I mentioned, we will use nortriptyline, amitriptyline. We'll follow guidelines as we would for chronic pain elsewhere. Um, in the past, desolopin has been used, venlafaxine has been used, fluoxetine has been used. It's not something that we tend to use that often. And there is some evidence for duloxetine as well. But I would say, and as I'll mention later on, there is no, no strong evidence for one treatment over another. So we will tailor this to individual patients, uh, side effects, benefits, and so on. And we will often try several agents um, sequentially with or without much luck. And we will use gabapentin and pregabalin as alternatives. Again, no strong evidence, um, robust evidence, but individual patients will, will benefit from these at times. Burning mouth syndrome, again, this is very much, um, the management, as we'll come to, is very much the same as for atypical facial pain. This is a burning pain, a mucosal pain, not a deep bone pain. Um, affecting very often just the tongue, but any area of the oral mucosa. There is no clinical abnormality evident when you look at the patient's mouth. Interestingly, their symptoms are often relieved by eating, um, which again tends to suggest there's nothing wrong with the mucosa, which would tend to make, which would be made worse by eating. And this seems to be a manifestation of the gait theory that if they're eating, tasting, chewing, that gets to the brain faster than the, the, the pain uh, impulses and closes the gate and patients will chew gum as a way of uh, preventing their pain uh, coming on. It's called a symptom a syndrome because there are often very, uh, very other dominant symptoms that the patients will complain of. They don't taste things the way they used to. They can't taste certain things or they may have an unpleasant taste, a dysgeusia, like a metallic taste or a bitter taste. And they also perceive that their mouth is dry even though it's clinically not dry. So these are things that can add to the, the, the discomfort and the distress in these patients. Again, it's a diagnosis of exclusion. There is no associated local pathology evident and we don't um, detect any systemic pathology. We will check full blood count, um, hematinic ferritin folate B12 because a latent hematinic deficiency can result in mucosal pain. But that, as I said, would tend to be aggravated by eating rather than relieved by eating. And occasionally we'll pick up a patient um, who has a, a raised random blood glucose. So those are just the baseline th uh, tests that we will do to add to our diagnosis of exclusion. Again, it's a female preponderance. There is no evidence of a causal link between anxiety and depression and burning mouth, but there is certainly a strong association if you do any of the, 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 the scales and the measurements. And again, much like the previous slide for atypical facial pain, we will use antidepressants. Very little evidence. Um, there is some evidence for topical clonazepam. Um, there, is, there was a, a randomized control trial of a small number of patients where sucking a clonazepam tablet seemed to result in um, assistance with burning mouth sy sy symptoms and also uh, clonazepam made up as a suspension and used as a mouthwash. Now, I don't suspect there is no systemic absorption from this, so there may well be that element to it. And obviously there are concerns about how long these patients may be on it and so on. But that's one of the only things that there is a slightly higher level of evidence for compared to other measures. Again, the gabapentinoids have a place and cognitive, cognitive behavioural therapy, if it is available, is at least as good as anything else pharma pharmacologically in terms of managing um, these symptoms. 
discussing with the patients again saying to them you know we know what this we know what this is we have seen patients like this before patients come in say I've never heard of this before I don't know anybody else who's got this I'm depressed it's affecting my life but they are reassured by a sympathetic um, understanding approach to this and that you know what they are um, telling you is not imaginary and again um, after whatever efforts we can make um, we may well involve a, a pain clinic for, for a more holistic approach. There, is, there are some trials which suggest that systemic alpha lipoic acid is helpful, um, 600 milligrams twice or three times a day. I've tried it in a few patients <coughs> and it hasn't made any difference but it's a very small number that's just my anecdotal evidence. Topical or even systemic capsaicin, um, now again these um, are, are not necessarily readily available but there is a little bit of evidence for that, and topical lidocaine, uh, lidocaine sprays or lidocaine gels again, but that may be more of a, a sort of uh, just a simply something topical in the mouth which creates a different stimulus which happens to, to overcome the pain stimulus. But again, very little robust evidence for anything that we use. The outcomes for these patients are a little bit depressing, although that's not necessarily what we would t tell them at the first visit. Um, one statistic says that 60 to 70 percent of patients will go on to have this for 15 to 20 years, um, and then it may spontaneously resolve. Um, in a, a population-based questionnaire study, after four years, with or without treatment, patients, at least half the patients still had problems, and the persistence of pain was again associated with female, being older, anxiety and depression and other widespread pain uh, or um, other pain conditions and widespread body pain. So the outlook is not always terrific for these patients. My own experience is that these patients, if you start them on treatment, um, within uh, two or three months they begin to say, oh it's it gets better in patches. It's not a kind of gradual de decrease. They say, oh, I was great for a few weeks and then it came back and I was really depressed and then it went away again for a while and that was for a little bit longer. So they seem to get better in patches and then they get to a stage where they think it's still there but it's not bothering me so much so I can manage it, I can live with it. So that, that's what individual patients will tell you, that they, they, they seem to get better in spells um, rather than sort of in a, in a nice straight line pattern. So overall, for any of these things that I've mentioned, temporomandibular dysfunction, burning mouth, and persistent idiopathic facial pain, the evidence for specific treatments is weak due to problems with study design, varying diagnostic criteria, difficulty agreeing the diagnostic criteria for different conditions, and heterogene heterogeneity of patient populations or, or study design. There are very small numbers of randomised controlled trials in this area, very small numbers of patients and incomplete data. So that's why we very often extrapolate the evidence from chronic pain studies and guidelines from other areas. There is certainly a role for complementary medicine, I think. Um, the evidence, as in other areas, is uh, it, it varies in quality. I'm happy if my patients find something like acupuncture or they feel that homeopathic remedies help them. I'm happy for them if that gives them some benefit. There is a little bit of evidence for acupuncture in, in, these, in some of these patients, um, but again, it's not uh, the, of the most robust. But again, a number of patients do find acupuncture helpful. It's just they have difficulty accessing it at times. I'll talk a little bit about trigeminal neuralgia, which again is something that we, we do get referred in quite a lot, or the pains we get referred in turn out to be trigeminal neuralgia. Um, as you know, it may be idiopathic in many cases, or it may be secondary to intracranial pathology, benign tumours um, uh, at the cerebellopontine angle, um, MS, demyelination, or brainstem pathology. And the theory, there is this ignition theory that damage to the myelin sheath, particularly around the, the root entry zone, results in widespread um, triggering of, of pain, like the, the, the uh, response in the nerve is sufficiently great to create pain um, in the distribution of one or more branches of the trigeminal nerve. Um, it is a severe electric shock like lancinating pain, usually of short duration, and most patients um, will be pain-free between these electric shock-like 
um, episodes, but they may come very frequently. And some patients have a more atypical form of neuralgia where they have a constant background pain between the lancinating episodes. There are typically trigger areas, touching the face, washing the face, trying to shave, putting on makeup, cream, so on, even a cool breeze will trigger um, these electric shocks. Um, Classically, and by definition, there is no neurological deficit, but it depends how you test it. There may be some very subtle neurological deficits if um, more detailed testing is done. The mi minority of patients have sleep disturbance. Um, there are no autonomic features, which would put it into a different category of autonomic cephalalgia. And the condition itself is quite rare. Bilateral trigeminal neuralgia is even rare. It's 6% it's of what is already a rare, very rare condition. So the majority of patients, the vast majority of patients, have it unilaterally. Thank goodness for that. It is a clinical diagnosis. Um, we certainly consider in most patients imaging of the brain, MRI or CT scanning to look for a spatial occupying lesion, demyelination or vascular compression. But the, um, the the turn-up rate of that is, is relatively low, possibly 15 to 20 percent of patients have something structurally um, that may be related to their symptom. And there is um, always the chance of picking up an incidentaloma, which you have to explain to the patient and may need some other investigation, but is not related to their trigeminal neuralgia. If the pain trigger is peripheral enough and um, what we sometimes see is there will be pain in the distribution of the mental uh, nerve. So from the sort of premolar region forward on one side, touching the chin will trigger pain or touching the cheek will trigger pain. These, these, branch, the, these branches are accessible to nerve block, as is the inferior dental nerve. If you ever go to the dentist and have a filling and you're numb from here to here with an injection through the medial pterygoid muscle, you, we can access bits of the trigeminal nerve with local anesthesia, which is a good test if the patient is in severe pain and you block that with lidocaine, you can then block the same nerve with a much longer lasting uh, local anaesthetic like bupivacaine and they may have several hours of relief while you're trying to, to work out the medical management of this. And patients may come back for two or three days in, you know, in succession for uh, another long-acting local anaesthetic block just to give them some relief while you're sort of trying to get the next stage of treatment underway. Um, the surgical management, um, there, is, there is certainly uh, room for cryotherapy in some of these patients. Again, mental nerve blocks uh, freezing or infraorbital blocks with cryotherapy. And I had one patient who came back 11 times over about 10 years for repeat cryotherapy. And you, you open up the gum to look for the mental nerve and it regrows despite you freezing it and damaging it it will regrow the patient will be numb for a few months but they will be pain free for several months as well and not necessarily require any medical therapy at that point um, but eventually it tends to to, uh, to 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 run out of control and you may have to move to a more definitive surgical procedure and my, our colleagues in neurosurgery will consider a balloon compression uh, going up through foramen ovale um, gamma knife radiation, which is available in Sheffield and London, but not in Glasgow. Um, and these are destructive procedures, so the patients may end up with some facial numbness and perhaps loss of the blink reflex. But they have reasonably good figures of length of time for pain relief. And then the biggest operation, microvascular decompression, which again has reasonably good success rate for, for pain and duration of pain relief, but it is a fairly major su surgery and it depends on the fitness of the patient for that. Um, surgical outcomes um, vary in terms of their success rates and complications, but um, we are very fortunate in Glasgow to have Nigel Sutner, who is uh, very re readily accessible for our patients um, should we begin to have problems with, with medical management. Carbamazepine is the drug of first choice for trigeminal neuralgia. Um, there, are, there, is, there are several RCTs which show that it is effective, and there are RCTs for its daughter drug, oxcarbazepine, which may be better tolerated. Um, 
The second line choice n tends to be now gabapentin, although there's not much strong evidence for that, but it is again better tolerated than some of the alternatives. We tend not to be using phenytoin and so on that much, at least in, in our own clinic, and there is room for combination or add-on therapy, perhaps with uh, lamotrigine or baclofen. These patients, either through side effects or difficulties um, with interactions with medication, generally tend over the course of years to become uh, refractory to medical management. So we do more often than not end up involving our colleagues in neurosurgery for these patients. Um, and just briefly, post neuralgia, I've only seen two or three patients, I see a lot of patients with um, orofacial herpes zoster, but I've only seen a handful of patients who have gone on to develop post-herpetic neuralgia, this constant aching or burning pain in the distribution uh, of the uh, original zoster episode. Again, there may be lancinating episodes of pain and there may be hyperalgesia in, in the region that was affected. Um, carbamazepine, gabapentin and so on can be used for this. Probably, the, particularly in older patients who may be the ones who are, are more likely to have um, shingles, trying to prevent it by aggressive treatment of the, first, of the episode of herpes zoster may be the best way of trying to avoid post-herpetic neuralgia. So fairly hefty doses of, of antivirals and consider adding am amitriptyline in during the episode of herpes zoster as well for a period of two to three months to try and prevent post-herpetic neuralgia developing. If the first line treatments don't succeed, um, then the, mo the recent um, side gui sign guideline on chronic pain has suggested that you can try topical capsaicin at 8% or lidocaine plasters um, at 5% for the management of post-herpetic neuralgia. Um, but I say, patients I have seen have generally responded fairly well to a combination of, say, amitriptyline or nortriptyline and um, plus or minus gabapentin. But I haven't seen that many cases of post-herpetic neuralgia in the, the head and neck region. Um, that's all I was planning to say, and thank you very much for your attention.